I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Some Queens students get a big honor at City Hall on a big anniversary for the tradition of Christmas Carol. One of the ways we're keeping it alive is by honoring Christmas caroling in America here today at the City Council. Plus, the Catholic Church wants you to know there's no place like home for the holidays. And the Knights of Columbus honor local students for keeping Christ in Christmas. Little kids, they think all about the presents and just ask for presents and presents, but they have to remember what's really important, and that's about Jesus. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. As far as the music magazine Billboard is concerned, secular artists are topping the charts when it comes to Christmas music. Mariah Carey's modern day classic, All I Want for Christmas Is You, is currently the number one Christmas song this year, followed by Justin Bieber's Mistletoe. Nat King Cole, Brenda Lee, Jose Feliciano, some definite classics there, also rounding out the top five. But when it comes to Christmas music, and more specifically Christmas caroling here in the U.S., the man we may have to think of and may have to thank as well as none other than Jacob Rees. Well, not quite sure who that is. Well, students at One Queen's School are looking to educate people, and their efforts are getting a lot of attention, including a big honor yesterday at City Hall. The Aquinas Society um, of Magic Exception School are here today at City Hall. We're celebrating the 100th anniversary of Christmas caroling brought to our country by Jacob Reese. This year marks the 100th anniversary of Christmas caroling in America through the historical documentations brought together by the Richmond Hill Society and the Immaculate Conception School. With advances in technology, people are able to have Christmas carols in their own home without people coming to knock at their door. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I've enjoyed a few occasions this year where I've already been exposed to people singing joyous Christmas carols and it is one of the delights of the holiday season. So I don't see it ever ending. And, uh, and one of the ways we're keeping it alive is by honoring Christmas caroling in America here today at the City Council. The students were kind enough as they do Christmas caroling every year, um, we're also to work with the Richmond Hill Historical Society to put a book together called Jacob's Gift, which has a historical encounter step by step. And what happened is we went through all the archives of the Richmond Hill Historical Society. We dug out all the newspapers. And once we had the newspapers, we found different characters who were who, neighbors of Jacob Reese. Uh, Ella Flanders is in the book. Um, the uh, reverend who was the pastor at the Reese Family Church is in the book. And we put together, uh, they put together a story of how it might have happened a hundred years ago. It started when he noticed that his dear friend Ella was not at church. When he discovered that she was sick. He got an answer in his dreams and he realized that he should go sing around, go around and sing to the people that were sick and bring them joy. He took all of his closest friends and family and they gathered around singing from house to house about all of the basic Christmas carols, Merry Christmas, Oh Come All Ye Faithful, and all of the basic Christmas songs. If they read this book, it could give them a piece of history on how Christmas caroling began. And it's always nice to know a few things that you never knew in your life. I am extremely proud of my students and Mr. Bellinas for all of their hard work in research and producing many, many projects that um, serve the community very well. When I was younger, um, we used to carol from house to house and we would go out for an hour and ring to people's doorbells and, and carol. That's not the case that much, I don't think, anymore. I don't experience that in my hometown. Um, and I just, I think that it's a, it's a lost tradition that really should keep, it should be kept alive. You really do learn something new every day. A lot of fun and a big honor for those kids. Well, stay with us. There's more Currents ahead. There's new life for a religious freedom commission. That story plus the rest of the day's headlines next.
Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up later, an art contest teaches students that there's more to Christmas than just gifts. First though, let's have a look at the day's headlines. After almost two months of uncertainty, Congress voted late last week to reauthorize the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. That's a move that the bishops, U.S. bishops, have been pushing for. The commission reports on religious rights abuses around the world. The Senate approved an amendment on Tuesday to reauthorize the commission for three years, and the House approved that on Friday. That's the day that the commission was scheduled to close. In Virginia, the state's Board of Social Services approved rule changes that would allow adoption agencies to choose prospective parents based on sexual orientation. The board voted 5-1 to one to approve the rules, which would also allow adoption agencies to choose parents based on age, disability, gender, family status, and political beliefs. The decision is a complete 180 from a similar situation in Illinois this year in which Catholic adoption agencies were told they would have to grant adoptions to unmarried and same-sex couples. Now, three dioceses there ended their adoption services. A fourth social service agency split from its diocese. Meanwhile, the Catholic bishops of Illinois met with uh, Governor Pat Quinn last week, but the two sides have some conflicting accounts of that meeting. Quinn, who is Catholic, says he and the bishops focused on the need to fight poverty and to help the poor. Now, on the other hand, the Chicago Sun-Times reports the bishop's main reason for the meeting was to admonish the governor for using his Catholic upbringing to justify support for a bill that gave same-sex couples many of the same rights as married couples. Last month, the bishops also issued a statement saying they regretted Quinn's decision to hand out a pro-choice leadership award. A Michigan woman is suing a school district after her son was removed from class for stating his opposition to homosexuality. According to the Detroit Free Press, a teacher kicked the boy out of class after the student said his Catholic faith prohibited him from accepting homosexuality. The mother says the Howell Public School District and the teacher violated her son's constitutional rights. Reports say another student was kicked out of class for the same reason. Well, it's back to court for a Canadian bishop who pleaded guilty to child pornography charges. Bishop Raymond LaHaye entered the plea earlier this year, and now his sentencing hearing is underway. LaHaye was arrested in September 2009 at an Ottawa airport after police there discovered hundreds of images of child pornography on his computer. At his sentencing hearing, a psychiatrist who assessed LaHaye for both the prosecution and the defense Say the retired bishop is not a pedophile and does not pose a risk to his community. LaHaye will be sentenced on January 4th. Well, Christians are far and away the largest religious group on the planet, with about 2.2 billion people. According to a new Pew Forum study, the U.S. has the largest Christian population in the world, with more than 247 million people. That's followed by Brazil and Mexico. China also made the top 10. Its 67 million Christians are more than any Western European country. Now, meantime, Islam is the world's second largest religion with around 1.6 billion followers. Well, Catholic organizations are helping out in the Philippines after a typhoon caused deadly flash flooding this weekend. Reports say the death toll could be close to 1,000, with tens of thousands more Filipinos left homeless. Filipino President Benigno Aquino has declared a state of emergency for affected areas. Catholic Relief Service's country representative for the Philippines says survivors have nothing left. Well, could the death of North Korean pre uh, leader Kim Jong-il be a turning point for reunification of the Korean Peninsula? Well, that's what bishops in South Korea are hoping for. Rome Reports has more on the plight of Christians in the communist-controlled North. Organization Open Doors works to help persecuted Christians around the world. They have contact with tens of thousands of people in the country. It's believed there's around half a million Christians in North Korea who are forced to practice their faith in secret. The North Korean government has strictly forbidden Christianity. Open Doors has said that anyone caught with a Bible can be sent to one of the country's many concentration camps along with their family. The Vatican Foundation Aid to the Church in Need has said North Korea is probably the most difficult place in the world for a Christian to live. South Korean bishops have said they hope the death of Kim Jong-il can be a turning point for the country and toward a reunification of North and South Korea. 
Meantime, Cuba's government says it is preparing to greet Pope Benedict with affection and respect when the Pope visits Cuba next spring. This past weekend, Cuban President Raul Castro met with a delegation from the Vatican to discuss the Pope's visit. It'll be the first time that a Pope has visited the communist-controlled country since John Paul II did so back in 1998. Well, meanwhile, Pope Benedict paid a visit to a prison in Rome over the weekend. The inmates were allowed to speak directly to the Pope. One man asked Benedict to make sure prisoners are not stripped of their dignity or freedom. And the Pope had his own message for the inmates. So, che il sovraffollamento e il degrado delle carceri possano rendere ancora più amara la detenzione. Mi sono giunte varie lettere di detenuti che lo sottolineano. È importante che le istituzioni promuovano un'attenta analisi della situazione carceraria oggi, verificano le strutture, i mezzi, il personale, in modo che i detenuti non scontino mai una doppia pena. I carcerati sono persone umane che meritano, nonostante il loro crimine, di essere trattati con rispetto e dignità. Hanno bisogno della nostra sollecitudine. Well, Benedict also greeted several of the prisoners personally. Well, Pope Benedict will personally ordain a Bronx-born priest as an archbishop. Last month, the Pope appointed Monsignor Charles Brown as the Apostolic Nuncio to Ireland. Now, along with the appointment, Monsignor Brown was named an archbishop. Catholic News Service reports his ordination will take place on January 6th. That is the Feast of the Epiphany. Monsignor Brown has worked as an official at the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Well, a vandal hit one of Rome's oldest churches over the weekend. Reports say someone used a rock to damage the bronze doors of the Basilica of St. Mary Major. The suspect seriously damaged a sculptured portrayal of the Annunciation and knocked off six saintly badges from the doors. Police reportedly arrested a homeless man in the case. And two New York natives will be among the church's newest saints. Pope Benedict approved decrees to canonize Blessed Kateri Tekawitha and Blessed Marianne Cope. Now, Tekawitha was a 17th century American Indian who lived in upstate New York. She was known as the Lily of the Mohawks. Marianne Cope, meanwhile, was a native of Utica who went to the Hawaiian island of Molokai to care for leprosy patients. Well, stay with us. There's more currents ahead. Coming up, will you be home for Christmas? We'll talk to one man who sure hopes so. Welcome back. If you've been watching television during this Advent season, you've probably caught many of the Christmas staples on TV there. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, for example, maybe, I don't know, Frosty the Snowman, and of course, a Charlie Brown Christmas, one of, one of my personal favorites. And prime time is Christmas time here on NET, and hopefully you've been tuning into the programming here on this station, and uh, maybe uh, you've tuned into things like, I don't know, Christmas time, or Christmas in Rome, that is, uh, The Secret of the Nutcracker, and The Legends of Santa. All great programming right here on NET. But regardless of what you've been watching, there's a good chance that you've seen a commercial like this one. For 2,000 years, our family has celebrated life and prayed for our world. We cared for the poor, started hospitals, blessed marriages, and educated generations of children. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are the Catholic Church. It's part of a new campaign from Catholics Come Home, an organization that invites people to enter or come home to the Catholic Church. Our Maria Elena Giassi had chance to hear more about it when she spoke with the president of Catholics Come Home, Tom Peterson. Tom Peterson joining us from Catholics Come Home. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be with you. Advent blessings. Same to you. Same to Thanks. you. And we're here to talk about Catholics Come Home launching a new ad campaign on national television. What's prompted this? 
the, what prompted it is that Jesus prompted it. He calls us all as baptized Catholics to spread the good news of, uh, you know, his teachings uh, to the world, and, uh, and we're doing that. We're answering that call. It's the same call that Pope John Paul II reiterated in the new evangelization when he was pope, and that Pope Benedict carries on today, telling us all to bring the good news to the ends of the earth and to help heal our world that is in desperate need of uh, Jesus' message. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, is that message that you're putting out there, is, is that message going to be geared told solely toward inactive or lapsed Catholics, or are you trying to reach a broader audience? We're trying to reach every soul on the planet. You know, Catholics Come Home started primarily as a uh, means of reaching out to our brothers and sisters, our family members who were away from the church. Uh, for some reason or another, they drifted away. They got busy, slept in on Sunday, took their kids to sporting events, worked something, uh, and drifted away. But we found over the years in helping 30 archdioceses and dioceses, and now going national, that people are uh, looking at the Catholic Church for the first time. We've had eighth and people of non-Catholic faiths convert to the church. We've had a whole lot of people come home to the church, and a number of folks, uh, thousands and thousands, uh, say, I want to go deeper in my faith. I want to take my faith more seriously. So this has affected, uh, it's been seen by over 40 million people uh, on a regional basis. The national ads could be seen by as many as 250 million people, uh, but it's touching lives in a positive way. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, previously, you run ads on faith-based stations, and now you're moving to uh, more secular networks. Did you find that the message was not as effective as you hoped on faith-based stations, or what, what's the reason for the move to the national? We've always run on secular stations. Uh, sure, we've shared our spots with uh, groups like you and others, uh, faith-based mm -hmm. stations around the country, but we've always aired and bought our way into secular stations in markets like Boston, Chicago, Phoenix, um, and uh, Atlanta, all around the country. So these ads have been on the most popular secular programs and uh, network affiliates around the country. The only difference now is that we're airing on national TV networks like CBS and NBC and national cable shows, the popular primetime shows that people are watching, NBC Nightly News, Today Show, the college football bowl games. So same message geared toward a secular audience where they are, but now on a national basis, coast to coast, not just regionally. Wow. And you're also gearing the message not only in English, but also in Spanish to our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters. Absolutely. It's critical. You know, uh, Hispanics have always been a major part of our Catholic family, yes. and uh, we've done everything bilingually, and not just translating into a different language, but making it culturally sensitive and appropriate. You know, Edward Verastegui is the host of our Catholicos Regressin site, and he does a beautiful job giving his own testimony of how he led a very uh, secular life, drifted away from faith, but through the prayers of his mother and the encouragement of his friends, he came home to his Catholic family. That's beautiful. And if I understand correctly, you're going to be funding this through donations, private donations from Catholics. Absolutely. About 30,000 families from over 30 dioceses around the country have contributed something. It could have been $5 or $100 or more to help air these ads because we all seem to have family members, friends, relatives, and neighbors away from the Catholic faith. And it pains our hearts to see that some people are even away from God. So, so many people are praying for this. So many people have contributed. And those listeners today can still contribute to Catholics Come Home Dot org, have a tax-deductible donation before year-end, and help us to run more spots on prime shows in national network TV. And those, that means the ads will run in New York, New Jersey, every single city in the United States when they're on national TV. Excellent. We look forward to seeing those ads, and thank you, Tom, for being with us today. God bless you, and Merry Christmas. Same to you. Stay with us. There's more Currents ahead. When we return, local students are rewarded for remembering the reason for the season. We get in, in, involved in the hustle and bustle of uh, Christmas and shopping and everything else, but hopefully we don't uh, forget uh, the important values of uh, that day of uh, December 25th. Finally tonight, Keeping Christ in Christmas. 
It's a popular theme this time of year, at least in Christian circles, of course. An annual contest from the diocesan newspaper The Tablet and the Knights of Columbus allows students from across the Brooklyn Diocese to, to do just that, to keep Christ in Christmas. But it also lets them showcase their artistic talents and celebrate Christmas with family and friends. We had a chance to visit with this year's winners at a celebration at the Knights of Columbus Archbishop Hughes Council in Diker Heights, Brooklyn. here to honor our Keep Christ in Christmas Award winners. We had 595 entries from over 25 elementary schools and more than eight high schools. And it was just an amazing turnout and response for the contest. And we're so excited to be awarding these students from kindergarten through high school age. We're trying to keep the real meaning of Christmas and that's the birth of Christ. And if you see some of the artwork, Jesus is there, and that's good. We got to keep the belief alive. Christmas with Christ at the center. I think that's family together, going to Mass, celebrating the day together, um, enjoying each other's presence, and, and, you know, even presents, the physical ones, to make it a very special day that recalls the gift that God gave us. I feel totally proud of Joanna, hard worker, and I feel a lot of gratification that um, she's pursuing a talent and sharing it with others and sacrificing her time. And I just am like a proud mom, but I'm her teacher. <laughs> well, my picture shows Santa Claus looking in the mirror and his reflection is Jesus. So it kind of shows the two halves of Christmas. The meaning of Christmas to me is it's like it has a religious half, but it also has like the half of presents and Santa Claus. Everyone knows that Jesus was the best gift of all, and I just showed it. Little kids, they think all about the presents and just ask for presents and presents, but they they have to remember what's really important, and that's about Jesus. We do forget uh, sometimes the meaning because we get in, involved in the hustle and bustle of uh, Christmas and shopping and everything else, but hopefully we don't uh, forget uh, the important values of uh, that day of uh, December 25th. I want them to feel the joy of Christmas and I want them to, to experience the love and the joy of Christ in their lives and to feel that tonight as they hear the music and as they're recognized for their interpretation of how they've kept Christ in Christmas in their lives. You know, when I was a teenager, I had a t-shirt that said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And there you have kids doing it right there and being honored for it by the Knights of Columbus and the tablet. Well, that's it for uh, this edition of Currents. Now coming up tomorrow, Catholic Charities plays Santa for some needy families. Until then though, make sure and visit us online over at CurrentsNY.net. You can also connect with us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter as well. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.